My favorite chapter in the book, William, is uh, about chapter one, Manesh Pabrai. Um, we're lucky enough to be interviewing him in a few weeks. Do you have any oh, advice? Well, mm. I know you've spent multiple days in India with him, driving through the chaos and seeing his good deeds over there. Like, mm. uh, how can mm. we prepare for that interview? Well, I prepare for everything pretty obsessively, so I just I just read a lot and watch a lot of interviews and stuff. But I think wh- wh- one of the things I really like about Monish is. M- Monish is obsessed with this guy, David Hawkins, who I'm kind of obsessed with as well, who wrote a book called Power Versus Force. And Hawkins has this idea. Hawkins ran the biggest um, uh, uh, psychotherapy practice in New York City at one point, but then became a kind of enlightened mystic. And he wrote this book, Power Versus Force, where he says, basically, different types of behavior kind of calibrate at a different level. And so one of the lessons that Monish took from this is, well, So I don't want to lie ever. I'm just going to try to be truthful because if I'm lying, people will sense it. And if I'm truthful, they'll sense that too. And so you actually become more powerful when you become more truthful. And I I look at books like Power Versus Force and other other books of David Hawkins, which have had a huge impact on me as well. And and I draw slightly different lessons from them than Monish. So, So I also see that things like, you know, compassion, mercy, love, kindness, things like that also calibrate really high. So it's not just that you want to be more truthful. It's that you kind of want to become kinder and more loving and all of these, you know, tedious things that we all know, but but actually turn out to be really important in terms of having a happy and truly abundant life. But what all of this means is that because God, because Monish is obsessed with truthfulness, he's a wonderful person to interview because you can ask him stuff that's really impertinent mm-hmm. and, um, and he'll answer it. And um, so, so for me, I tend to avoid interviewing people who um, I think are not uh, a not going to be truthful, and b are not into examining these difficult questions like their own. I, I, I always like interviewing people about things like their failures and their setbacks, and when things didn't work out, and how they deal with adversity and pain. And, and yeah. failure and public shame and things like that. And and when you interview someone who actually talks honestly about that stuff, it's really wonderful. And and someone like Monish is really open about that stuff. So um, I, I think that's really wonderful. You have an opportunity actually not to be superficial with someone who's just trying to market himself because uh, Monish, Monish, Monish deeply believes in the power of truth. And so I... He's, he, he's also very decent. He's very kind. I, I had an experiment once that I probably shouldn't tell you about, but I'll, I'll tell you about it anyway, where um, there was a moment where Monish was going to buy some copies of my book to give as a gift to lots of people. And and I wrote to him and I said, and, and, and so I'm interested in this idea of truthfulness, that truth is a kind of, being truthful is a kind of superpower. And so I wrote to him and I said, um, if you do it this way, it's going to be more expensive and it'll benefit me. And if you do it this way, it'll be less expensive and it'll benefit you. And he immediately chose the way that was beneficial to me, not him. I thought that was a really interesting insight into his personality that he, um, he wanted to do it in a way that helped me, even if it hurt his own self-interest and also I mean, that was interesting because he did it. He did it behind closed doors. I mean, I'm telling you this, but this is something, you know, he didn't do this so that I could praise him publicly. It's the way he behaves. And so when you see people like that who are committed to being honest and truthful and sharing, and I, I, I also did it as an experiment to see if I'm truthful with him, does that work? Is it better to be truthful? And so it's sort of experimenting candor for me. Um, but you also see the measure of the man. He's... He's, you know, he's not flawless like all of us, but he's a, you know, he's got tremendous integrity and he takes seriously these ideas of, of being truthful. So, so there's a lot to learn from him, not just about how to get rich, but actually about how to behave, I would say. And that, that, so that's had a big impact on me seeing how he operates. Cause it, when you see people like, Monish or his friend Guy Spear, who's one of my closest friends, you can see the way they behave and it makes you think, oh, I need to be a bit more like that. 
and um <laughs> and so it makes it makes you i mean it, it, you know they famously had a lunch with warren buffett back in i think 2009 where they paid six hundred and fifty thousand one hundred dollars to have lunch with with buffett and the money was going to charity and buffett said to them hang out with people who are better than you and you can't help but improve and so i think you this had a big effect on them and on me because it makes you think okay so so what's the company that i'm keeping am i am i am i hanging out with people who are ethical who are decent who are thoughtful and um i don't know i think mo you were saying before that you know you're hanging out with paul I, like mm -hmm. you want to hang out with people who have values that you um Resonate you admire with. and that, yep. you, yeah and because uh, it so so choosing your environment your intellectual environment is very important but also choosing your moral environment and so 100%. part of what you're doing when you're investing is you're saying do i want this manager of money this advisor in my life is it someone i trust are they decent are they honorable how do they treat their spouse how do they treat their kids are they are they charitable um and and so so to some extent I, I own Berkshire Hathaway, right? And I bought it much, much later than I should. I would have been much wealthier if I'd bought it many <laughs> years earlier. But part of the reason why I like to own Berkshire is not because I think it's necessarily going to beat the market by a mile, although I think it'll do well over many years. It's like, I kind of want more of Buffett and Munger in my life. I think they behave in a, in a kind of honorable way and have them in my portfolio and have a Vanguard index fund in my portfolio, given that Vanguard, I think, was built on this idea of taking care of the shareholder, not screwing the shareholder. I want a bit more of that in my life. And I own Guy Spears, Aquamarine Fund, um, because Guy is honorable, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to lionize and celebrate people, um, you know, pretend that they're all flawless. So, you know, we're all deeply flawed human beings working on ourselves. But, but I mean, hang out with people who are better than you and do, do it in every way. One, one of the things Mungo says is uh, you want to hang out with the eminent dead. And so he's hanging out with Ben Franklin and mm -hmm. Darwin and Newton and people right. like that. He's learning from them very consciously. And, and so, um, I don't know, these choices you make about who, who you invest with, they're not just financial decisions. They are to some degree, moral and intellectual decisions right i have a friend a guy called brian lawrence very brilliant hedge fund manager who said to me a few months ago that he was thinking of saying to people who invest in his fund what's the money for like what if i make all if i'm going to make all this money for you what's it for i i think that's such an interesting question it's like well yeah what's the money for why 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 do you want to get rich what are you what are you looking to do with the money are you is it just for you so you can buy a ferrari um, not to knock Ferraris, but, you know, Monish has a beautiful Ferrari, but, you know, but he's also educating thousands of kids. Mm -hmm. and, and so these questions about um, sort of the inner aspect of investing and wealth creation, I think, are you know, your, your YouTube channel, right? It's everything money. It's not just it's not just money so you can buy a fancier car and a bigger house. It's everything money. What, what's it actually for? Paul, what and you I, I, I want to make two, two or three comments. First off, to, to the comment about Vanguard. Vanguard manages seven and a half trillion dollars. When Jack mm. Bogle died, it was estimated he was worth 30 million. Guys, do you understand that concept? He was only worth 30 million having a company that he started that managed seven and a half trillion. Talk about a massive pro investor outlook. 30 million dollars. I mean, listen, I've I've been honest here. I'm worth more than that. The guy started literally the biggest. Literally the biggest, mm -hmm. you know, mutual fund company in the world, and he was worth thirty million. Two, I will yeah. say one thing. Everybody says hang out with somebody smarter, better than you. I don't agree with that. What I agree with is hang out with people who are doing what you want to do. Because I don't like the whole smarter, better. Because if let's say hypothetically a room of ten people, if you tell everybody hang out with the smartest person in the room, the smartest person is going to leave. And the next smartest person is going to leave. I was going to say, you're and sitting here with me, Paul, and not well, leveling up I, I don't mean it to say that. I just mean it to say, I've always found for myself, just like you said earlier, William, go find the people you want to be like, that you gravitate mm -hmm. towards, the things that make sense when you do a lot of reading. Like, William, you sat there and said, I found myself gravitating towards honest people. Great. Mm -hmm. Find honest people. They might not be smarter than you, 
But if they're honest, you're going to feel much better than being with people who are who are yeah. who are smarter than you, but are shysty. I've met smart people who are very shysty. Mm. Yeah. That's awful. And but the good news is, most shysty people I've met are very stupid people. That's the good news, mm. and that's why they're shysty because they have <laughs> to resort to stupidity and tricks and salesmanship. And then that makes my third comment. I found that the best investors ever were terrible salespeople. That's what mm. I love. You know, uh, Gary Mashuris, who runs a fund that I'm invested in, smart guy in Boston. He wrote an article where he said, if you had met Warren Buffett in 1955, you'd have never invested in Warren Buffett in 1955 because he wore ugly clothes. He looked like a doofus. He wore these big glasses. He couldn't speak to you about anything and he couldn't sell you. He'd come to your door and say, do you have $10,000 to invest in my, in my fund? No. Okay. Sounds good. He'd come back next month. He wasn't a salesperson. Mm. You know, He wasn't like, hey, how are their wife and kids? How are you guys doing? Oh my God. He was just an investor. And that was what that's what made him such a good investor was that he wasn't a salesperson. He focused on investing. And that's just maybe a one-off, but I found that the best investor, Gary always tells well, me. When we went to dinner one time and with, with Gary, Paul told him, yes, I'm going to invest your fund. And as he was taking him to his hotel, he was he, he was still trying to like sell him. And he's like, you got the yes, Gary, stop selling And me. Gary's Cause time, he's, yeah. cause he's not a good sales. <laughs> I was like, yeah. by the way, Gary had me before. He wanted to come out and meet me. I was like, Gary, I'm investing in you because I like you. I've heard your investment philosophy. I don't even see any. Ret- I didn't see any of his returns yeah. at all. I had right, no yeah. idea his returns. Was I like, go, oh, Gary? I like you, and I like your process. That's all I need. Done. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. No, I would agree with that. I want. I want to rewind a bit because um, you you were talking about Bogle and how honorable he was. I want to tell you a story that even people who read read the book carefully may have missed because it's tucked away in in a section called Notes on Additional Sources and Resources, which I, I couldn't have figured out a more boring uh, <laughs> title, title for a section if I had tried. But, I, but I've, um, I've tucked away some, some kind of cool stories that I couldn't figure out how to get in the rest of the book. And there's one that I tell about interviewing Jack Bogle, the founder of, um, of uh, Vanguard 20 something years ago. And this was actually on the phone. I, I remember I was in the Time Life Building in Midtown Manhattan and I'm calling him and suddenly the phone goes dead. And I'm like, oh, God, you know, I'm like, Mr. Bogle, Mr. Bogle, have I lost you? And I was interviewing him about his mentor, um, this guy called Walter Morgan, who was one of the pioneers of the mutual fund business. And the phone goes dead because I realized suddenly he's crying as he's talking about his mentor. And, And he said, sorry, it's putting tears in my eyes talking about Mr. Morgan. And I said, how come? And he said, because I, I realized how much he did for me and how much I love him, how, how much I loved him. And I, and, I, and I was trying to explain what it, when I wrote about Bogle, like what it was that he learned from Morgan. And, and the thing that he learned from Morgan, among other things, is that, as he put it, the shareholder is king. And he said, that someone once wrote to Mr. Morgan and said, Mr. Morgan, um, who is a shareholder in one of Morgan's in, in Morgan's mutual fund. And he said, Mr. Morgan, I don't have a suit. I don't have a good suit. Do you have a suit? And Bogle said to me, by God, Mr. Morgan sent him one of his own suits. And so if you think about that, if you think about Bogle, who's been dead for years, 20 years ago, choking up and crying as he's talking about his mentor, teaching him that the shareholder is king so much so that he gave a person gave a shareholder of his fund his own suit that that mindset had such a huge impact on bogle and that infused the way that vanguard was set up and so i'm not saying index funds necessarily have to be the best investment you know look if you invest in an index fund and the market's very high you're also buying stocks that are very high i mean it's it's not it's not an uncomplicated um choice but but it's still a good choice because the expenses are so low that over time you'll you should do very well but that mindset of the shareholder is king is so powerful and so so part of what i was trying to do in the book with was to take someone like bogle and take someone like walter morgan and celebrate that behavior that mindset and to say to people this is important actually understanding whether the person you're investing with thinks that the shareholder is king or understanding whether they look at you as a mark who they're going to sell to who they can ream it's a really important thing mm-hmm. and and so, so someone like someone like guy spear 
I, I've never really known, you know, I mean, I've invested in his hedge fund for 22 years or something. And one of the reasons was just half of the money in the fund was his family's fund. It was his family's money. So I knew that our interests were aligned. And then over the years, he just kept changing the fee structure in ways that were worse for him mm -hmm. and better for the shareholder. So, so I'm now in a fee class where there's a five-year lockup. You can't sell in less than five years. So it's forcing me to be patient. But there's zero annual management fee, no annual management fee. Wow. And he makes 15% of the profits oh. after an annual hurdle of 6%. So if he makes less than 6%, he makes nothing. And so if, if you go through years where the market gets killed, he'll make nothing. And there was a guy um, who said to him, you know, guy, do you understand that you will be working for free for many years if things go wrong? And he's like, yeah, welcome to the world of aligned interests. And <laughs> so I don't know how the future is going to go. I don't know where the guy is going to beat the market. I don't, but I know that he's, he's structured things in a fair and honest way. And so that to me, that stuff really matters to me, whether someone, whether someone's looking out for my interest. And so I'm not saying this in any way as an ad for guy, I'm just saying you have to think about these things of, of whether, whether people are behaving in a way that seems honorable and you can tell it from their fee structure, from the way they charge and, and from whether they're eating their own cooking. I, I remember once writing, writing a story um, about these, these two guys who ran a fund where they had made, I think, $180 million or something in fees over uh, th three years or something like that when they, they trailed the market by 50, 50 percentage points. But they had so, their assets were so high and their fees were so egregiously high that they, um, they got rich while performing like crap. And they were really smart guys and they were really great marketers and they were good stock pickers. And they were decent and I liked them and they were funny but they set things up in a way that gouged their shareholders. And, and I'm like, ah, I, don't know. I, I don't really want to be, I, I, I'm not going to invest with them, however smart they are. You know, William, I can get from the tone, you know, just, just from the emails we exchanged, um, I knew this would be a really great interview. And it seems like, uh, you know, I had a, I'm a photographer by trade, but my, uh, my career transition when I just started celebrating others, and it seems like you do a really great job of selling, celebrating everyone else in the world that you've come in contact with, over yourself. So it's been really wonderful to have you on. I know the the book is, is doing really well. I know you're incredibly excited to have this translated into multiple languages moving forward as the year progresses. So just in general, if you'd like to promote and where can people find you? How can they connect with you? Um, tell, tell our viewers uh, how they can get a hold of you or, or connect with you. Sure. Thanks so much. Yeah. I, my website is um, williamgreenwrites.com. Uh, which you can you can tell I'm, I'm I'm so good at the marketing stuff that I never figured out how to do that gizmo where you can track the people have visited your website. Uh, so so um, uh, so at least you'll know you're not being marketed to unless one day I figure out how to do that. Which, uh, you can usually bet on my technological incompetence. I'll never figure it out. Um, uh, but there but there are quite a lot of resources on the website, different interviews that I've done and old articles of mine and stuff like that. Um, if you're interested. And um, uh, the book is available everywhere. It's always pretty cheap at Amazon, um, uh, but feel free to buy it elsewhere, which is good for the world. Um, people love the audio edition, um, which is recorded by a guy called Raphael Corkhill, who has a, 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 an even posher English accent. Than yeah, I, I love do. that guy. It was uh, a, you, you picked a great guy to read the book. He's incredible. He's yeah, really he's really good. He, he actually, he went to Eton as well, same high school as I did. But he, um, but he's he's sort of multilingual, and I think among different languages that he speaks is Russian. And he looks, he's he's a good-looking guy, but with this very kind of chiseled, chiseled <laughs> face. And we we met for lunch a few months ago, and he's he's always he's an actor, and so he's always playing like Russian mobsters on TV shows and stuff. You know, he's a he's a kind of scary, scary-looking Russian mobster. But he's he does a very good job reading the book. Um, and I'm on Twitter at William Green seventy two. And I'm on LinkedIn, and and really, I I hope your um, listeners will feel free to reach out to me. I'm 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 constantly behind in replying to people and feeling <laughs> guilty about it, but I but I do try. Um, so so yeah, don't be mortally offended if I fail or if I take a long time. But but I like hearing from people, uh, and 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 it's uh, I, I I very much feel that we're on the same journey. We're all kind of trying to trying to grope our way through the fog, and and it's um. It's it's nice to hear from people and hear what's helped them. I, I, I love it, Seth, when you say 
the the the, the chapter on Monish um, helped you and was interesting to you because it's like oh that's great that's something I slaved away at for like five months yeah and yeah. Uh, and to hear that it actually helped you is is, is really nice because because what I am trying to do is is distill the most helpful and interesting and thoughtful stuff that I've learned because. It, it's not that I'm so wise or I'm so smart. I'm I'm pretty lost, and so I'm trying to figure out. Oh, that's how you invest. Oh, that's how you deal with it. Me when too. You fail yeah. When you set, you know, well, oh, that's what the money needs. So, so I'm literally I'm interviewing these guys, and I'm like, so, so what do you get out of being rich? Like, what has it given you, and hasn't it given you? And so when you have one of these great investors like Ed Thorpe saying, well, look, at the end of the day, what really matters is who you spend your time with. That's that's like deep wisdom accumulated by an 80 something year old guy who, um, you know, is one of the master game players of all time. And you're asking him, how do you play the game of life? And so those are the things that I'm really interested in. It's like distilling this practical wisdom, not only about how to get rich and become financially independent and, and secure, but also how, how do you live? How do you think about it? What constitutes a successful and abundant life? And that, that's what I'm trying to figure out for myself and then share those ideas with other people. So, so when it resonates with, with people and when, if, if, if your listeners read this stuff and it helps them, I'm, I'm really happy to hear it because it's like, oh, my life isn't meaningless. I've actually, I've actually done something that might be vaguely helpful, which is always a... a it will a, help. A, That's a very good book. Very, very good book. Forward. Yeah, uh, for our viewers out there, in every one of our videos for the past six months, there's been a link below to buy the book. You can grab it on Amazon. Uh, William, I'd love to have you on in the future. Uh, us as a team, would love to get insight. And if you're, obviously, if you come up with more books, we'll certainly buy them, read them. Because we, so. we have hundred, we have a hundred thousand subscribers now, but we are amazing. Within two years, we'll probably be at a million. And William, we like you. At some point, you need to do the self promotion. And when you write uh, your next book, you give us an email and say, "Guys, I'm writing a new book. I need to promote it." We will gladly have you on. And hopefully by then we'll sell 10 million copies for you. Ah, thank you. Well, I'm always happy to come back. And, and as you can see, it takes me so long to answer any questions. You could ask me about three questions about my book and it'll <laughs> fill up an hour and a half. So, yeah, it's great. So, you know, so, we, we barely scratched the surface, guys. We're, we're only just getting started. I'm getting warmed up. We'll come up. to New York so, and we'll do it in person. Uh -huh. Yeah, great. All right, oh, William, great. thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. And um, yeah, thanks for watching. And we'll follow up with William in the future. See you guys.